Welcome to the Blue Security Podcast, a weekly podcast for information security defenders, where we bring you discussions on best practices, tools, and implementation for enterprise security. Now, here are your hosts for today's show, Andy Ja and Adam Brewer. Welcome to this week's episode of the Blue Security Podcast. I'm Andy, your host. I'm Adam, your co-host. Tonight, we're going to talk a little bit about password cracking and how that works. I think having an understanding and some basics around how passwords are cracked will help you scope different password policies and just understand how password crackers think. And that will help you think about how to keep your users at your organization safe. Now, some of this stuff is pretty basic. So if you already know it, you know, feel free to listen in. Maybe you'll learn something new. A lot of this stuff is always good to review just in case to understand what makes a better password, even though we want to move into a more passwordless environment. We understand that passwords are still very, very much a part of our everyday information security posture. So if you ever watch like a TV show, Adam, and and watch people like crack passwords and they just get it like super easily, like they just guess a couple of things. That's not how most passwords are cracked. Surprisingly, right? So in reality, it's not just guessing passwords. It's sometimes you can do that, but it's it's definitely not just knowing a little bit about like your adversary or your target. Like if I knew Adam and I knew he graduated from Iowa State, I could guess, you know, what is it, Hawkeyes? Hey, no, that's, Cyclones. I'm sorry, Cyclones. <laughs> that was my mistake, my mistake. So I couldn't just guess the mascot of Iowa State. Um, so what happens generally is a site is breached and their database is breached and those credentials and usernames and email addresses are taken. Um, sometimes it's in the clear, but in these day, this day and age, most of the time the passwords are stored in what are called hashes. And those usernames, email addresses, and hashes, password hashes, are then posted to forums, dark web forums, and hacking forums. And then the race is on to like figure out what the passwords are from these hashes. Adam, can you tell our listeners what it means to have a password as a hash. Sure. So if you're familiar with encryption, it's that process of taking information and then scrambling it so it's unreadable. But the thing about encryption is it's then reversible. So I can unencrypt it. I can change it back to its original data. Hashing is different than encryption in the sense that it's one way. It's non-reversible. So like encryption, there's a lot of math involved, but differently, there's no way to reassemble it back to its original format. So by the way, if you've ever been in like Windows Server and you've seen user passwords and you've ever seen that checkbox for a user and like store password in a reversible format, this is why you don't want to do that because hashes are secure in the sense that I can have a hash and there's no way to, to put it back to the original password. So it's basically, I have data do a whole bunch of math to it, spit out a string of characters that always returns that same result. So if I start with this password and I run it through this hashing algorithm, this set of math, then I get the same hash as a result every time. That's how passwords are actually stored in something like Active Directory for Windows. When you type in your password, Active Directory runs it through the MD5 or Message Digest 5 hashing algorithm, and it takes the password you typed and it gets a hash and it stores the hash in your user object. Essentially, I'm simplifying some of this, but this is the basic idea. And so then next time I go to sign in again, again, there's, there's no way for admins or anybody else to like dump the database and view my password, but they could view my hash. And so the next time I go to sign in, I type in my same password. It runs it through that same hashing algorithm And it returns that same hash over again. So then it does a compare. Does this hash match the hash in the database? If yes, the user typed their password correctly and let them sign in. If not, they didn't do it right and they need to try again. So that's that's how any good system at a minimum 
uh, stores passwords is in, you know, that hash format. So just the key concept here, non-reversible. And the other concept is that it's just math. It's just a set of algorithms. And the idea to a good hashing algorithm, the one other thing I'll say, should never return the same hash for two different inputs. That's called a collision, where if I put in this way, I get this hash. And if I put in something totally different, I could potentially get that same hash. That's called a collision and that's bad. We don't want those. So as hashing algorithms have improved over time, one of their goals is to reduce the number of collisions they get where different input data can return the same hash as a result. So that's your kind of 30, 60 second pitch on what a hash is and a little bit on the hashing algorithm that I think is going to be most relevant to today's discussion, which is Message Digest 5 or MD5 for short. So once the hacker has the hash, what they did was they would compare the hashes to a list of known plain text words or passwords and a list of associated hashes. And if you have the hash and the matches, then you know the associated plain text. Again, this was more in the early days and crackers used to even have rainbow tables. A rainbow table was just a large database of known hashes along with their associated passwords. And you could compare these very, very quickly. You just do a, a diff or something like that and compare uh, the hash that you have to a, a large table. And if you find one that matches, like say password one, two, three with a capital P, of course, then you would know the password because you the hash is matched. So rainbow tables, you know, one of the benefits of them where they could still potentially be used today by attackers is that they're pre-computed. You've already done all that hashing work ahead of time. So then it's really, really easy. So if I know a lot about your password policy and I know a lot about the user I'm attempting to compromise and maybe whatever attack I'm doing, I expect to have very limited amount of time to compare. I could pre-compute a rainbow table that knows the password policy is minimum eight characters, this, that, and this, and that here's the name of Andy's dogs and his favorite sports teams. So I'm going to generate a whole bunch of combinations that use those and different numbers and symbols to try to, you know, crack Andy's password when I do gain access to the database. So there are still some uses for attackers today with rainbow tables, where the idea is you pre-compute and you're ready to go so that when you gain access to the hash, you can do that comparison really quickly. There are some disadvantages, especially if you're doing like a large, large rainbow table, they take up a lot of space, but it, it doesn't take a lot of time to run these comparisons. It's very, very quick. And so there are benefits. I think of it a lot like a signature based antivirus, right? Mm -hmm. If it matches, it's quick. It's kind of like table stakes. You can still run a rainbow table uh, on a known list of hashes that you have, and it doesn't take a lot of time. It's not like it's going to take days to do this you know, comparison. So still some benefits, but it was mostly a technique that was used in the past. Now, rainbow tables are susceptible to some defenses that have been applied to hashes over the years. One of them is called assault. Assault is basically additional characters that are either placed at the beginning or at the end of a password before it's hashed. And typically what most defenders or web developers or whoever is programming this, they design a salt algorithm that will salt a password based on the user. So even if Adam and I had the same password, our salt algorithm would be different. And so the generated hash would be different, even though we had the same password. That's obviously is able to be cracked if you find out what the hash, or I'm sorry, if you know what the salt is for that particular site. There's also something called a pepper, which puts random bits of data into the password prior to hashing. And salt and peppers are different in the fact that peppers aren't stored with the database with the hash. They're hard coded into the website's source code. But even if you know or I'm sorry, even if the password is salted or peppered, it still can be cracked because really it just comes down to time and the computational power of the machine that they're using to crack the password. So I think one of the takeaways is no matter 
how complex or long your password is with the amount with the right amount of time and with the right amount of computational power every password eventually can be cracked and that kind of brings us to how most passwords are cracked today and that is mainly with brute force and brute force is just trying every single known character in sequence to try to figure out the combinations let's say we have 96 some possible characters uh, including all the letters numbers uppercase lowercase special symbols all that and i just start from the beginning right capital a capital b and then going to two characters right capital a with another capital a capital a with another capital b and so on and so forth and trying every single combination and moving on and so that's how most passwords are cracked today and most of the crackers use gpus and uh, graphic cards which have gotten very very powerful and the reason why they do that is because they can run a lot of simple calculations at scale gpus are very popular with bitcoin miners they're very popular with password crackers and so most gpus can do up to like six million or more computations per second whereas like if you're just doing it off of the cpu which is limited by cores and processors and threads most cpus can only do maybe like twenty thousand. so you're greatly exponentially increasing the number of guesses and computations that you can do for brute force if you're moving to a gpu and great call out there that all of the uh cryptography uh, crypto coins, NFTs, all that stuff, blockchain has really accelerated the availability of the tools needed to build a password cracking rig. It doesn't take that much money. Um, for for $20,000, you can build a really advanced cracking rig uh, that can do a very large number of guesses per second. And all of that stuff is readily available because, again, all of the uh, crypto mining that's been going on today. Yeah, Alex Weinhardt wrote a really great blog article that is titled Your Password Doesn't Matter. I think we've referred to this article in the past. It's been out there for a while, but it's, it's really the gift good. that keeps read. on giving, man. It's such a good blog yeah. post. I highly recommend giving this a read. We'll put the link in the show note, of course, but it, it goes through a bunch of different... Um, a bunch of different types of attacks, which is also good to know because there's credential stuffing, there's password spraying, and those are different types of password attacks and you know, phishing or keystroke logging. So he goes through every type of different attack that are that's out there as far as um, passwords. Uh, but then he also has uh, specifically in this conversation here, the benefits of having longer passwords and what that really equates to because as adam said i mean you can get a pretty good rig these days for password cracking with just you know like honestly you could probably do it with five six thousand dollars and get a pretty decent rig you put in twenty thousand dollars and get a bunch of gpus strung together and you have a very powerful mm -hmm. password cracking rig that can probably crack most passwords pretty quickly if they're not very long so he has this table here which is kind of eye-opening if your six pa if your password is only six characters it will only take eight seconds for a twenty thousand dollar rig to crack that password in brute force and then as you increase the amount of characters that you have the time that it takes to crack it gets exponentially greater and adam and i were talking before the show and we kind of noted that the breaking point is really between roughly eight to ten characters because at eight characters it takes 20 hours to crack a password with this twenty thousand dollar rig at nine characters it takes three months but then at 10 characters, it takes 21 years. So, I mean, like, the difference between 8 to 10 characters is massive. I mean, who's going to sit and let something run for 21 years to crack a single password? 
no one, right? So um, that was really interesting. And so really, I think one of the lessons is, is, you know, length over complexity. If you're trying to have a better password, just put an extra character at the end, you know, make it 10 characters. And right there, you're, you're looking at roughly 21 years in order to brute force that particular password. I still see a lot of password guidance. And in fact, the Microsoft's password guidance is still eight characters or higher, um, which, which I think is interesting because you get so much longer by going to that ninth character. And so it, it is, again, that, that major balance of um, sensitivity of the user, I think, as well. For, for a non-VIP, and you have to think of most attacks today are all built around return on investment. And 20 hours, really long time to try to crack an individual password when something like password spray may be more effective anyway and, and may return results, you know, in a more timely fashion across multiple organizations or something. Or I could just fish you and you'll just give it to me anyway. You know, there's there's so many other methods to acquire passwords that even brute forcing a single password for 20 hours outside of a VIP, I think for most attackers is unlikely. Again, this is a twenty thousand dollar rig, um, and it's pe- it's pegged. You know, it's it's that's all it's doing is trying to crack passwords. You can't do anything else on that machine. And so, I think for most attackers who I think have actually pretty humble equipment, that's probably beyond their reach. You know, for even a less expensive machine. So this is this is kind of worst case scenario is is what's being highlighted here. So that's that's why it's interesting to me that guidance still is eight passwords even when you have that huge jump up. But you could see right here for your VIPs, for anybody in your C suite, you don't need 12, 13, 14. I mean, 10 is literally 21 years. Like we're good. We are so good at that point. That password's not getting cracked. You know, it could be acquired through other means and way more likely to be acquired through something like a phishing attack anyway. Um, but from, from a cracking perspective, I mean, 10 is absolutely the upper bound where we're just, you know, the boogeyman of quantum <laughs> is really the only thing we really have to fear. And again, maybe nation states who could put together literally supercomputers to do this. But otherwise, um, you know, for the realm of any normal commodity attack, you are well protected at that point. I also think just important to know length is important, but again, those rainbow tables are still being used. So if you're using like password one, two, three, four, five, or something like that to get to 10 characters, like that's going to be discovered on a rainbow table, right? Like the attackers are still going to run them through known hashes of plain text, you know, common passwords that are being used. So that's such a good, something like a pass- good comparison you gave when you compared it to signature based antivirus. That's such a good comparison because that's exactly it. It's, hey, let's try this super computationally cheap and easy thing first and see what we come up with. And and by the way, like there aren't a lot of scenarios where I'm stealing like one user hash. Like if I have one user hash, I have all of them. And so I'm not really concerned with any one user. I just want to find some user passwords so that I can get started moving around your environment. If I manage to dump uh, your your Active Directory database where all the hashes are stored or something, right? Or or a website database or whatever. Um, there are methods to steal a single hash, and those are interesting. I remember in my Certified Ethical Hacker um, training, we talked about stealing like different NTLM hashes as users were trying to authenticate to like file shares. Now those are different than like the MD5 hash for passwords because those are salted, so you can't use a rainbow table on them. And I remember, you know, some of the interesting conversation around them of you have to do like either you have to pretend to be a malicious file server or you have to do some sort of network based attack. So you see the packets come back to you with the hashes. So like it's much it's very, very tricky. It's possible for sure um, to steal an individual like single hash floating around. But in most of these scenarios where we're talking about all this cracking, you have an entire database of hashes. And so it, you're less focused on, I want to get Andy Jaws hash. It's, I want to find some hashes that I can you know get started with moving around. It's a really fun exercise as well. If you want to try this, I recommend doing it in a lab or if you plan on doing it in your production environment, you want to pull it off of like a backup of your domain controller, but you can use 
John the Ripper, which is a very common password cracking tool. It's a brute force tool. It has rainbow tables built in. You can build a custom rainbow table if you want. And you have to have your ntds.dit file, which has the Active Directory um, passwords, as well as the key to decrypt that DIT file. The DIT file is encrypted, and the key to decrypt it is also with Active Directory. So I ran through this exercise at one of the orgs that I worked with just as a fun exercise, as well as an educational campaign to passwords. And what we did was we took a shadow copy from our domain controller on a backup so we weren't pulling it off of our production domain controller. We got the DIT file as well as the key, and then we decrypted it and ran it through John the Ripper. The first thing we did was run it through a very basic table, like how Adam talked about, where we knew our company. We So we put like company name with the year exclamation mark, or like because we're in Wisconsin, we did like Packers you know, exclamation mark or Brewers or Badgers or whatever. And so we built a very simple, probably 10 to 15 word rainbow table with the associated hashes and ran them through. And actually we, we got several, right? Because company name were like autumn 2016 exclamation mark or spring 2016 exclamation mark. Those were all in there. And so we just did that and we got several people that way very easily. And that took no time at all. Then we actually ran it through the brute force password cracker and we didn't run it for very long. I think we ran it for like a week and we got to maybe six or seven characters uh, and we were able to crack several, you know, of character uh, of passwords just by brute forcing it. Um, and so that was uh, or actually I think we ran to like eight, eight characters was how, how long we, we went for. And I think with this basic server, it was, um, it wasn't like super, super beefy or anything like that, but we ran it off of a server blade. And so we were able to get several passwords that way, but it was a fun exercise to do. If you have a lab environment, definitely give this a try because it's a good learning experience. If you do it at a, at an organization, it's great to like use this as an education campaign and say, Hey, even with very, very minimal assets, I was able to crack this many users, this many passwords and you can go to those users and kind of give them an education, maybe put together a password uh, strength education campaign to educate your users. So something that I would recommend doing if, if you had time. I second this completely. I used uh, John the Ripper when I did the certified ethical hacker as well. And it was very eye opening to just understand how this all works and how commoditized these tools are today. Again, by this by the time an attacker probably has been able to gain access to this, they've they've been able to do it other ways. I think it's less of a concern with Active Directory. Uh, but again, like when websites get dumped, you know, there's always like, oh, this website had their password table dumped, or this pa uh, website did, and especially if they're not salted, you know, they're <laughs> the, the the bad guys are going to be out running those through these these engines and seeing how many passwords they can come up with and the point i keep making is for most attackers they're not focused on any one person's password it's just how many can i find you know there's that cat and mouse game but it's also those are then commodities you can sell you know on the dark web as well is is selling validated uh username password combinations that have been proven out and and those generally go for literally you know cents on the dollar uh, it's not terribly expensive to go find some user identities in different enterprises or different websites or whatever. And then you can start um, hacking your way through things. So this is, it, it's just great to get hands on the tools. It's, you can understand all this conceptually. And I'd say I did, and I, I'm sure most of our listeners do, you know, as security professionals, we understand conceptually what password hacking looks like. Oh boy, it's it's on a different level when you fire up one of these tools and you you kick it off and you see how many guesses it's gone through, even on not impressive hardware, and you're just like, holy smokes, you know, this is the thing. And and again, this doesn't replace the other methods through which passwords are potentially compromised, but it is it is definitely enlightening to understand uh, what this looks like. And and certainly you'll believe in salting helps, peppering helps. Um, but again, like Andy said, it's only a matter of time. And so 
Let's bump those password lengths to a minimum of eight or better. Uh, ideally, you know, 10 and beyond, you're pretty good. So you don't really need to go higher than that. And uh, uh, gosh, this is just a, uh, a really eye-opening exercise. That's our show for this week. Thanks for listening and watching. Hopefully you learned a little bit about password cracking or at least reviewed the basic concepts and that'll help your orgs make better policy. If you have any questions, our contact information will be in the show notes. Thanks. And we'll talk to you guys next week. Thank you for listening to the blue security podcast. Please check out the show notes, catch up on episodes you may have missed and subscribe. So you don't miss any future episodes. Find Andy on Twitter at a jaw zero and Adam at AJ Brewer. See you at our next episode.